last Sunday, we looked at Philippians chapter 1, and the title of my message was Six Words or Less. Can you describe your life or your purpose for life in six words or less? Now, we saw that the Apostle Paul did this when he said the words, For me to live is Christ. That was his purpose in life. Well, now we come to chapter 2, and Paul talks about what that means to live like Christ. I found a a little story that I thought was interesting. Uh, There now is a perfume company that claims their perfume will make you smell like Jesus. And what they did, it's a company out of California, of course, where else? And it's called Virtue. And if you put this on, you'll smell like probably what Jesus smelled like our disciples. Well, they used the Bible as a guide, and they looked at all of the different plants that were used as perfumes in the Holy Land when Jesus walked this earth. And they said, virtue is a close, really close to probably how Jesus and his followers smelled. They said, it is uh, mostly a fragrance of apricot with a dash of frankincense and myrrh in there. Now, you recognize those last two. Those were the gifts that the wise men brought to Jesus at his birth. So you can officially smell like Jesus. Now, my response to that, I have this word. I'm going to use one word, and this describes my whole feeling toward all of this as I look at this. And that word is absurd. I just go, are you kidding me? (laughs) I think what we should be saying, rather than saying, I want to smell like Jesus. We should be saying, I want to be like Jesus. Max Lucado summed that up in these words. God loves you just the way you are, but he refuses to leave you that way. He wants you to be like Jesus. This is what Paul is trying to explain to us in Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 11 how to be like Jesus. And so he begins with this first step. To be like Jesus means we have humility. Paul says in Philippians 2, 3, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. In humility, value others above yourselves. Now, To get our definition from these verses of what humility is, we need to look at what the world's definition is. The world looks at humility and says, humility is weakness. You have no spine. You have no backbone. Humility is an attitude of doom and gloom. Humility is being a doormat. You let people walk all over you. Humility is not standing up for your own opinions or your own rights. Yet, that's not what humility is. The Apostle Paul says your humility is looking out for the welfare of others. Humility is seeing others as equal to you. Humility is seeing other people as being just as important as you think you are. (laughs) Humility says, I don't put myself on a pedestal, but I see myself as someone God loves, and I am unique, but the person sitting next to me, God loves, and that person is unique, and you're unique, and, you're, and everybody in this room is important. Humility levels the playing field. Let me share, share you with you a story that kind of illustrates this. A lady pastor Um, went to a friend of hers that she knew, and he was an executive from a corporation, and he had risen through the ranks and achieved greatness by the world's standards. And so she went to talk to him and ask him, you know, what gave you this sense of accomplishment? Were you motivated by helping other people? Were you motivated by the social and economic Um, benefits that your company would give to the community? And the executive replied to her and says, no, not one of those. My main satisfaction has come from the love of the game. 
He says that I overcame a lot of obstacles and handicaps. I contended with some bitter opposition from other people in the company and my competitors. And then he says, but I've beaten them all and I came out on top. Well, that's not humility. Humility tries to help others, to bring them along so they can share in the same success. Humility doesn't want to finish first. Humility does not use every other person as a stepping stone to get what we want. But humility literally encourages other people. Humility literally drags the other person across the finish line also so that they can share in those successes. This really became clear to the Federal Center for Disease Control because they did an in-house experiment one time. And it really wasn't an experiment, but it turned out to be that way. When AIDS was first discovered, when the AIDS epidemic first came out, they decided to do an in-house contest, competition. And they got all these teams of scientists together. Now these were no slouches. These were individuals who were at top of their class in their particular field in genetics and engineering and everything else. Uh, they were scientists and doctors. And, and so they got them together, split them up into different teams, and said, you're looking for a cure for AIDS. And the first team that gets that cure, they had an incentive. And it was a really good incentive. <laughs> um, there was a lot of fame, a lot of fortune involved, a lot of prestige. But they soon found out that that turned out to be a mistake. Because in their zeal to win, some teams sabotaged the work of the other teams. They'd be walking by a lab and seeing them working on something and there might be a, a couple of test tubes sitting there with samples and then they'd go in and pour something else in there, ruining the samples. The turnover rate on those teams became like 75% because people just couldn't take it anymore. And finally, they had to stop having teams. And the one thing they realized is that people were just too competitive. They wanted to come across that finish line first and didn't care about anybody else. There's nothing wrong with wanting to win. But we don't win at the sacrifice of others. And they said we can't even count the cost in the kind of research that was ruined and lost forever. In this story, everyone was looking out for their own interests. And that brings us to the next step of humility, that if we have humility, not only do we see others as, a, as important as ourselves, but we're also looking out for the interests of others. Paul says, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. Now this text is not saying that you are not going to be concerned about your own interests. It doesn't say you're not going to stand, not to stand up for yourself. It doesn't say not to promote your point of view. But what it does says is we stop and we look at everybody else's view. And we look at their interests also. And humility brings that person along also. There's an interesting song that talks about it. And it's not even a religious song. It's almost like they took this from the Bible. But it was Simon and Garfunkel who back in the 70s wrote that wonderful song, many of you know, Like a Bridge Over Troubled Waters. And when you read these words, it really sounds a lot like what the Apostle Paul was saying. When you are weary, feeling small, when tears are in your eyes, I will dry them all. I am on your side. When times get rough and friends just don't come, can, cannot be found, like a bridge over troubled water, I will lay me down. This is what Paul is asking of us. This is what Paul is asking of believers to you. Don't look out for your own interests, but also look out for the interests of others. 
and be the person who comes alongside them and pulls them across the finish line. In other words, Paul is saying, if you have humility, you're going to be one who encourages others. You're going to be one who is looking at the interests of others and helping them in whatever way you can. Well, we find this in several passages of Scripture. And the Apostle Paul is the one who wrote these in 1 Thessalonians 5.11. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up, just as, in fact, you are doing. If you don't have humility, you're not going to be doing this. If you don't look out for the interests of others, if you don't see others as imp- that they are just as important as you are, you won't do this. Hebrews 10, 24 and 25. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Or we could paraphrase and say, let us consider how we may drag one another along or push the other person along or shove them along so they are living for Christ each day. But encouraging one another all the more. Ephesians 4, 29. Do not let any unwholesome talk Come out of your mouths, but only that which is helpful for building others up, that it may benefit those who listen. The words of a humble pil- the words of a humble person build a person up. Do not tear them down. Too often in our world today, words are used to tear people down to make ourselves look better, to make ourselves look good. Paul says a humble person is looking out for the interests of the other person. Does not want to see their feelings hurt. Does not want to tear them down, but rather to build them up. So Paul is basically telling us our humility is seen in how we treat others. Our humility is seen in how we encourage other people. Let's go back to those verses where he talks about Philippians. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. Now, if we have that kind of humility, then something else is going to show up in our life. Something else is going to become evident. And that something else is we are going to be willing to be a servant to others. And that's the second thing Paul brings out. To be like Christ is to be a servant. Philippians chapter 2, verse 5, Paul says these words, Have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking on the very nature of a servant. Jesus said several times that he came, the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. There is an interesting story that comes about someone who's willing to serve. Author Bruce Larson tells about a trip him and his wife had made to London, and they learned about an individual there, and the individual's name was Red Cap 42. Red Cap 42. You go, what in the world is that? Well, it was at Grand Central Station there, and his hat was red and had number 42 on it. And he would help people go from platform to platform carrying their luggage at the train station. Now, he did not just carry their luggage, but he also would talk with them. And he said these words. You know, everybody going through Grand Central isn't going to a honeymoon or a party. Many are going to funerals, the hospital even to prison. And while he took their luggage, he would talk with them and he would encourage them and counsel with them. He did this so well and it became so well known that he appeared in um, Reader's Digest under the heading called The Most Unforgettable People. Then there was a movie made about it also. So they heard this story and then they went to this person's house, a friend's house, and they were staying a couple days there. And as he's in this person house, person's house, he looks in on a little table. It's almost like a shrine, almost like a display. And of all things, here is what they call a Tom McCann shoehorn. 
It's just a regular shoehorn that you put in the back and, you know, get your shoes on. But they had it sitting there on a little stand, and he was wondering, what's so special about this? So he asked them, and the owner said these words. And the, the man's name, uh, Red Cap 42, his actual name was Ralston. And they said, Ralston left that behind when he was here. He stayed with us one night. And you know, we've kept it as kind of a religious icon. It reminds us that a man of God was here who brought a new dimension to our faith. Well, Bruce Larson later would write, These, those sophisticated Anglicans wanted a tangible reminder that a special person had passed through their lives. And that special person was simply someone who looked out for the interest of others. It was a person who simply encouraged others. It was a person who was a servant. That's what it means to be like Jesus. To have humility, to be a servant, to look out for the interests of others. Jesus looked on the crowds, it said in one passage of Scripture, and he had compassion upon them because they were like sheep without a shepherd, and he did something about it. To be like Jesus means to have humility, and that humility is seen in our being a servant to others. Now, we might be able to say in our lives, hey, I don't smell like Jesus. And some people have to think an amen. I don't smell like Jesus, but I sure hope I look like him. I sure hope I act like Jesus. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we are reminded that to look like you means to do the things that you did. And, won't. and two of those things were you had great humility. You looked out for the interests of others. You had compassion on other people. You encouraged other people. But you were also a servant to other people. And unless we have humility, we cannot do those things. May people look at our lives and see that humility and be able to say that person is like Jesus. We pray this in your name. Amen.